This week on Quality Digest Live, we examine some serious issues confronting the FDA. Plus, what can the voice of experience and the fear of regret teach us about performance excellence? We'll find out when we come back. Today's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Western Gauge Corporation, the dimensional gauging specialist. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for April 5th, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief Dirk Ducharme. So, dancing robots. <laughs> better than that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Something better than that, I hope. Okay. Yeah. That's going to be on YouTube, I'm sure. Okay. So, actually, no, this is not part of YouTube. Uh, it's actually part of uh, some research into robot movement being done by Amy uh, Laviers, a PhD candidate in electrical and computer engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. She is defining the various styles of human movement and creating algorithms to reproduce them on a humanoid, humanoid type robot uh, with dance as the medium. And I think, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. There's a little robot toy mm -hmm. called a, a NAO or NA, NAO or mm -hmm. NAO, anyway, which has a lot of uh, uh, freedom of movement in, in all of its joints. And she is able to uh, kind of program some ro uh, dance movements, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, into this robot. Um, and the reason for this is that robotic movements tend to be pretty stiff and unnatural. Un unlike mine. <laughs> yes, yes, we're not stiff at all. Um, <laughs> and Lavier says she believes that robots should have a change, uh, uh, should have, I'm sorry, should have a range of quality of movement. So to achieve mm -hmm. this, she is developing quantitative tools that explains what, differen what differentiates movements. And to do this, she is using uh, dance theorist Rudolf Laban's notion of quality as part of her research. Mm -hmm. Part of the goal is to make robots seem more... Uh, yeah, human-like. No. Oh. So, yeah. So, so that when, and, and, and actually, th there is a reason for yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, more and more robots are moving, uh, or they're, they're planning on moving them into household or clinical settings, and they don't want them to be so, uh, you know, off-putting. Yeah, because but, it's weird. I mean, you see this robot with the... Uh, yeah, these jerky up. movements yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or un, un, unnatural yeah. movements. And if, if you're going to start having human interaction with robots, which is a direction that we're going, mm -hmm. then uh, you want to make sure that it's something that people feel comfortable around. Now, this sounds a little strange, and, and people sometimes wonder why we choose to put stories like this in Quality Digest. And I'll tell you my own personal reason, and I happen to choose this story, um, is my feeling is that part of quality and innovation is about learning how other people synthesize knowledge. Now in this case you have uh, uh, this, this uh, um, Amy Leveres mm -hmm. who has been a dancer all her life. So she decides to go in, into robotics and computer science and thinks, well wait a minute, you know, um, I've got this dance background, robots move really kind of clunkily, maybe there's something that we can learn from this. And this makes sense to me. I mean, if you think about it, human movement has really uh, evolved uh, over the millennia, and we have learned to be pretty efficient with our movement mm -hmm. as humans. We've learned how to get the most out of movement. So isn't it possible that even in an industrial setting, this might make sense? And, and that's why I go for some of these stories. Someone looks at dance as a way to humanize robots for aesthetic reasons, but I say, why not for practical reasons as well? Maybe there's something that we can learn uh, in an industrial setting, uh, maybe, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe somebody has looked at this, I don't know, mm. um, but it seems to me that uh, maybe there is a more efficient, uh, efficient in terms of energy usage, efficient in terms of movement uh, that industrial robots do, and maybe we would learn something from, from her studies in terms of humanized robotic movement. And to me, that's the connection from industry uh, with this kind of story. And that's why I pick them. It's, yeah. it's like, makes you think a little bit outside the box. Yeah, and I mean, it's so prevalent. I mean, robotics are so prevalent. They've been prevalent for a long time. And, and there has always been a separation between the, the robotics and the, the human. 
And, and it is off-putting, I think, right. as, as you said in your story. And, and we know as we go along, because we've all seen the movies, uh, that, that robots coming. Are, coming. <laughs> are going to be much more human-like. Yeah. And, and it, it's going to enable it to be, uh, to be an easier fit for us, in, in, in not only industrial settings, but in our personal lives, too. Right. And I think it's, it's going to happen in research like, like the research that Dr. LaVere La, La, La 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 is, is yeah. doing, I think, is, is, is key for that as well. Uh, by the way, um, if you've got any questions oh, during yeah. the course mm -hmm. of the show, send them to us at QD at qualitydigest.com and we will try to get your questions on during the course of the show. That's right. And get them in now. If you, if you, uh, if you, you want to comment on robots right now, type us up a quick note and we'll... Or anything. We'll get or anything. Say you like Dirk's shirt or don't like mine. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Uh, His shirt's more Especially from my wife. Um, but <laughs> uh, write us at qdl at qualitydigest.com. Okay. Next story. Have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered, Dirk, how prehistoric yes, animals like dinosaurs actually moved? Well, if you have, then this next story is for you. It's interesting. We're going from a lot of synergy in this show today. We're going That's from movement of robots to movement, of movement dinosaurs. of dinosaurs. Right. So movement from the future and movement to the past. Uh, when Bill Sellers, the program director of zoology at the University of Manchester in the UK, wanted to better understand human and animal evolution, not to mention biomechanics, he turned to Geomagic Studios 3D imaging and reverse engineering software. 3D, I'm sorry, it's Geomagic Studio. Right. 3D engineering, reverse engineering software. Sellers brings these prehistoric, prehistoric animals back to life, in a certain sense, by using data from scans of those animals' skeletons. He then employs a special software, which they developed at, at his college, called GATSYM, G-A-I-T-S-Y-M, and it was developed at the college, and that simulates the gait of these digitized animals. And the data is then brought into Geomagic Studio, and it, he uses it to create what really are some incredibly accurate 3D models of, of these animals and a lot of different animals to, to understand the, uh, the, the kinesiology, the, the movement of, of how, they, how they worked and maybe understand, from, and you can see some of them right there, maybe understand how these actual animals actually did move. And you talked about robotics before and, and kind of a, the, the jerkiness of some robots. Well, many times when we, when we think about dinosaurs moving, we think about this kind of jerkiness maybe too, or these slow ponderous movements. Or, or these ponderous movements, yeah, exactly. But not yeah. necessarily. We, we, we don't know. Obviously, it's you know, 65, 70 or more million years ago. But this research that Sellers is doing enables us to maybe understand a little bit more about that. Um, now, the technology, of course, has applications beyond zoology and, and archaeology. Uh, it's used by kinesiologists, museum curators, veterinary surgeons, and, of course, as we all know, for 3D inspection, test, and measurement within manufacturing and assembly. Uh, and as we saw, you can see some of those images that, that were captured through the technique. And it's, it's really incredible that you can see how a, a dinosaur, an animal that's been dead for so long, actually moved and interacted within its physical environment. And, and it, it's, it's really incredible because, you know, Evolution works by, by, by parts of the body adapting as time moves along. And, you know, um, the way that archaeologists understand how an animal evolved from other animals is looking at, you know, the joints in its, in its wrists, right? I mean, they know now that, that say, whales actually were land-dwelling creatures like 20 million right. years ago. They were similar to hippopotamus. Okay. Uh, it's fascinating over the course yeah. of, of dozens of millions of years how you go from a land-dwelling large animal to a humongous sea animal, right? I mean, that's how evolution works, but they know that linkage through looking at the bones and understanding how the movements worked. And if I, again, if I can draw a connection, obviously we're talking about a story here where some, let's say, industrial software, right. uh, Geomagic, very often it's, it's used in a lot of settings, but very often when we talk about it, it's used in an industrial setting. Uh, but it's being used by archaeologists. But there's so much, there's so much synergy now between the way technology is crossing uh, and being used across a wide yeah. variety of, of interest areas. So you've got archaeology, yeah. you've got, uh, you know, you've sports got robotics, you've got yeah, sports yeah, surgery, yeah, yeah. you know, you've got, uh, you know, stuff happening yeah. on the production floor. And it's the same software being used to analyze all this in order to gain more insight into how something works. It is. And, you know, what the, the appeal for me in, in terms of what we do here is the fact that these are all tools. You know, these tools were not necessarily developed to do this specific work, but once the tool is, is out there, the tool itself has evolved, those of you out there, figure out how to use them for the work that you're doing. And, and these are very powerful, these are incredibly powerful tools that are, are applicable to a lot of the work that's being done in industrial settings. So, so check that out. So for more information on that story and, and, uh, and the story that Dirk just covered on robotics and uh, the feature articles we're going to be covering in a little bit, check out the story links right below the player page right down there. You can, uh, after the show is over, click through and 
Read all about it. That's right. Okay, well, in an article this week from Michael Causey, uh, he discusses a new report from Booz and Company that identifies the root causes for a growing number of medical device adverse events. That's basically <laughs> medical speak for, uh, oops, oops. <laughs> that ain't good. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. According to Causey, the FDA says adverse effects rose from a little more than 7,800 in 2001 to more than 28,000 mm. in 2009. That's an average hike of 17% per year. Mm -hmm. Worse, that average was much faster than the overall industry average growth rate of some 9% during the same period. The FDA says that nearly 70% of device recalls were traced to failures, get this, in product design, supplied materials, or manufacturing process. So basically the whole thing. Everything. Poor quality design, poor quality manufacturing, poor supply chain management. You've just about covered the whole thing. Yeah, pretty much so the problem yeah. basically is the whole thing. And now obviously there's also a human cost with all this, but the financial hit is pretty bad as well, according to Booz. The average decline in a device manufacturer's share price after a major quality event was 16.8% decline between uh, 2006 and 2009. That's an increase from an average decline due to adverse events of 9.8 percent between 2000 and 2002. So in other words, the, the, the financial repercussions of, of having an adverse event has gotten worse as time has gone by. Now, Kazi points to three root causes for all this. Uh, a siloed reactive approach to quality, a lack of focus of continuous improvement, uh, and these are kind of your, your general management issues that we talk about all the time, and of course the relentlessly growing complexity of medical devices themselves. Now, keep in mind that there is a lot of regulated, there's a lot of regulation related to medical devices. I say keep that in mind because I want to show you another story kind of related. We all recall the deadly outbreak in October 2012 of fungal meningitis associated with a, uh, a compounded medication. Uh, this was the, uh, the New England Compounding Center of uh, Framingham, Massachusetts, is now facing more than 400 lawsuits based on 620 infections and 39 deaths mm. of an outbreak of fungal meningitis and some other infections caused by contaminated drugs. In an article that we ran this week, FDA Commissioner Dr. Margaret Hamburg wrote that just recently there were two recalls of sterile compounded and repackaged, repackaged drug products. And one recall, uh, a fungus was reported in five bags of magnesium sulfate intravenous solution, resulting in a nationwide recall of that sterile drug. And in the other, all sterile drug products from a second pharmacy were recalled as a result of reports that five patients were diagnosed with serious eye infections associated with the use of repackaged Avastin. Now remember, this is coming from Dr. Margaret Hamburg of the FDA. So she says, uh, it turns out that the FDA doesn't have a lot of legal ground. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with these issues. Uh, Hamburg says, our authorities are limited and not the right fit for the FDA to provide appropriate, efficient oversight of this growing industry. The, the compounding pharmacy. Yeah. The, the compounding pharmacies, exactly, and, and interstate shipments and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, she goes on to say, no big surprise, quote, there should be legislation to establish appropriate minimum federal standards for firms that compound sterile drug products and ship them interstate. The FDA must have clear authority to proactively inspect pause, pharmacies to determine the scope and nature of their operation. So in other words, due to the growth of compounding pharmacies and the delivery methods, uh, the current laws don't provide enough oversight, so we need to provide more o oversight. I say, guess what? <laughs> That'll help. A little. <laughs> El tiny. Yeah. Uh, and I, you probably have to have laws on the book. I mean, you have to... You have to be able to take care of these situations sure. legally when they happen, but that isn't going to fix the problem. Remember our first story. That's the re reason I put that one first. The very first story, medical devices heavily regulated by the FDA, and yet there was a dramatic rise in medical adverse of, uh, device adverse effects. Mm -hmm. And that, that medical device industry is highly yeah. regulated. Yeah. And despite that, there was a whoosh. Yeah growth in those problems. The change has to come from within. What the yeah. FDA is going to do with compounding pharmacies is going to be give them some legal recourse, but they don't have enough people out there yeah. to inspect all the medical device manufacturers, yeah. all the you know, food supply chain, uh, you know, all the compounding pharmacies. It has to come from within. You mm -hmm. can't FDA inspect 
quality yeah. into these products. Into the products, yeah. And, and another thing, this to me is, is rather analogous to the whole HSPM situation where you have hazardous process, you have hazardous substances finding their way into electronics. The, ultimately, the manufacturer, the one that, that's facing forward with the customer, is the one that's responsible for everything that's in that product when it hits the, right. hits the customer. So ultimately, the responsibility rests with the, the, end, the end seller, I guess. Right. The, the, the company, the organization that is selling to the, to the, to the user. So yeah. they're the ones that have the biggest stake in this game. I mean, certainly suppliers that are supplying bad product, whether it be hazardous substances and electronics or, or uh, you know, chemicals or whatever it may be that go into a compounding uh, prescription pharmacy, um, they're going to go out of business if they can't provide good, good stuff. But ultimately, the lawsuits are probably going to come down, the FDA is going to come down on the ones that are selling it to the public and shut right. them down before anything else. You know, and by the way, we didn't, 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 that, that company, uh, what, New England... Of what, compounding pharmacies? Yeah, England, whatever it was. Uh, them, yeah. yeah, they filed bankruptcy. Yeah, I mean, obviously. I mean, they're being 400 lawsuits. sued left and right. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's, yeah, I mean, you and I, we talked about it yesterday kind of as we were doing our story. I mean, there's, there's so many issues around this. The, the idea that you can't expect quality into a product. Well, we know that doesn't work, and certainly... And yet that's the way we try to go about it. I, think, I, I, I mean, from a, from a government perspective. Yes. I'm, I'm not a... Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we, we can't... That you shouldn't have laws in place and some sort of... Uh, Oversight, but to think that you're going to do that and that's going to take care of the problem is no, not completely no, out there. It's not going to take care of the problem. It's, it's, it's a component of the solution because there needs to be there needs to be penalties for people that that step right. over the line or don't do what they have to or do or negligence or whatever or it negligence, is, yeah. whatever. Sure, there's got to be those penalties, but but this particular segment, FDA regulated industry, we're talking about food, we're talking about drugs, things that are going into people's bodies. It's different than, than automotives, or it's different from electronics, even if there are hazardous substances in electronics, right. because I mean. In those industries, industrial settings, you can you can you really can effectively do it financially, but you, you can kind of inspect quality in a product and, and segregate out batches that aren't that don't meet the uh, you know don't pass muster. But in this, when you're dealing with the food industry or the drug industry, and we saw it in Europe with the horse meat scandal, right. I mean it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle, and and you have to have that at the front upstream of the process. You can't do it at the end of the game. Right. You have to do it. You have to have the process in place to make sure that none of that stuff gets into your end product. Because if you don't, and if you fail, you're gonna be out of business, you're gonna hurt or kill people, and that, you just can't have that. Right. I mean, if, if quality's got a higher calling, it's to deal with things like this. Right. And I think we all need to be aware of that. Uh, that, that you know, the FDA's got a major role to play in this. I mean, hey, yeah. you know, they, they, they're the oversight. They, they really have to be leading now, I, I don't know that the FDA does this, but it seems to me one of the things they should be pushing is some sort of, and maybe they do, I don't know, um, somebody feel free to write in, uh, be pushing a quality management system. Yeah. In other words, maybe that should yeah. be a requirement, I, you, you know, know, is, is yeah. w some sort of quality management, you know, get that in place, yeah. and yeah, you might be doing it just for, sure. just to say you have the certificate, so the FDA would say, oh great, you have a certificate, but we all know that if you take it seriously, it's gonna help in, uh, build in, hopefully, uh, a quality process and, and keep you out of trouble. Right, so. and, uh, and uncover those issues before they, they hit, yeah. the, hit the audience, so that uh, right. hit, the, hit the user base, which is really important. So yeah, so write us, yeah, please, actually, let, let's remind everybody out there again. Uh, if you have a comment on that story, write us at qdlqualitydigest.com right now, and Dirk will get in his little earpiece right there, and we'll, we'll get it on the air. Doesn't keep popping out of it my ear. Keep popping out of his ear. He's got his ears are too big. My, the, yeah, my ears are too big. Yeah. <laughs> or the or the little piece is my too small. My brain is too small. That's yeah. probably something like that. Okay. Well, Dirk, thank you for that. Uh, let's turn to another story. I want to. What we just did with you there was you kind of you kind of took a story and augmented it with another story. I want to do kind of something very similar because there were a pair of stories that we ran this week in Quality Digest Daily that you know my mind really amplified and reflected really nicely off of one another and and it's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. So I want to talk to you about that a little bit. First one was uh, by Jack Dunnigan, and that appeared in Tuesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily called, Beware the Naked Man Who Wants to Give Fashion Advice. Great title. Yeah, love it. Love that. Talk <laughs> about getting, talk about getting, getting uh, attention. The other one was called, No Regret, a po uh, exclamation point, by Alan Austin, and that appeared in Thursday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. So, what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of talk to you a little bit about the stories and construct a narrative about what, what I think they mean and what I learned from them and, and how I think it, it, it applies to, to what we all, what you all do for a living every day, which is to, to uh, ensure sustained performance excellence in your organizations. Dunnigan writes, uh, and he goes back in time a little bit, to, to when he was a recent graduate and he was told by one of his professors, one of his mentors, well, 
after you graduated from college. Well, you have your degree, now go get an education. I love that. <laughs> Great advice, because it's, it's true. And, and what he found as he began his career was he didn't know anything. He didn't know what the heck he was doing. And he learned. He learned through mentors and he learned through doing. And he got some good advice about the, the practicality of, of experience. And, and, and not just good experiences, bad experiences as well. He, he learned that although higher education is really prized, uh, really the practical experience is more important when you get out in business and you start working for a living. Uh, I think bad experiences in many ways are more important than good ones because of what you learn. You learn so much more from those bad experiences. And the, the, the final thing, there was a lot in the story, but the final thing I want to just recap real quickly is people that he works with and the ones that really can help you, consultants and the like, they need to have practical experience too. And, and they, you know, you don't want people helping you in your business that have the, those that can't teach kind of approach right, to right. it. You want them to have rolled up their sleeves and been on the floor and, and, and been doing what you're doing to help you understand what you're doing and understand the, the, the benefit of perseverance and hard work. As a quick recap of, of Jack Dunning's story, let me turn real quickly and recap quickly Alan Alston's story and then I'll, I'll jump off. Alan tells a story about going to have a chat with his elderly mom uh, which he does regularly, of course, and he he was telling her, she was telling him a little bit about her life, and and she told him some things that were surprising, uh, and nothing nothing immoral, nothing illegal, nothing that it was you know that that dramatic, but just things that that she shared with him about her life, her youth, that he found surprising, and that he wondered if she maybe regretted some things that she did, and no, she didn't regret any of it, and and you know he really was kind of empowered by that, and he realized in in, in that and talking to that that you know regret can be thought of in many cases as a reluctance to, to, to face up to the past and, and to, hmm. to deal with what happened, right, and, and, and be, a, be an adult and grow from it. Uh, but without reflecting on the past, there's no going forward. You can't improve and learn who you are and where you're supposed to go if you don't understand what really happened and why. And he really compares it, he uses the two terms, MMQ, Monday morning quarterbacking, right, right. Uh, versus uh, versus after action review AAR, okay. and it's just a frame. You know yeah, which yeah, one yeah. you do. You know it's not really Monday morning quarterbacking. It's not going back and critiquing that or yourself or somebody else. It's saying, well, what happened and how can I improve from it? And he closes with uh, with a, a favorite story of mine and one of my favorite characters in history, Teddy Roosevelt, who um, gave an address to the Sorbonne in, in 1910. And he, he talks about the man in the arena. It's yeah, a really it's a great, well known it's a quote. Great quote. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to quote yeah. it because it's long. Yeah, it's it a 30, awesome. 35 it's awesome. page story. But, yeah. um, but read that quote and, and, and look that up, uh, the, 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 uh, the man in the arena quote from Teddy Roosevelt, where he talks about the fact that critics will, will, will run you down. If, you're, if you have the courage to stand there and deal with your issues and face them and learn from them, well, critics are going to criticize you for it, but they're never going to get the benefits of the experiences that you had. Right, even if you're wrong. Even if they're even right. Even if you're wrong. Yeah. Even if they're right and you're wrong. Yeah. They're not going to get out of it what you got out of it. Because yeah. you were there, you were in the arena, you took the chance to be there and you grew from it. So, all these things together, and that was the, the quick recap, all these things together coalesced in my mind and what I really thought about was, how do we learn? How do we grow in, in the world? How do we grow in life? How do we become the people that we, we are and the people that we want to be from what happened? And I think, in reflecting on this, the, the importance of experience and, and coming to grips with, with regret, I think, are really important. Because you can't ever, and this goes for your organizations too, you can't ever really improve yourself or your organizations if you're not willing to understand where you got where you are and what you can learn from it. We've all made mistakes, right? I mean, quality assurance is all about mistakes. If nobody ever made mistakes, if, if systems were, were you know, impeccable in their natural state, right, there wouldn't be any need for quality assurance. We'd right. all be out of a job. Yeah, the fact that we have a job says that there's, that there's problems. There's problems. Yeah. And, and, and some of the times the problem is us. And some of the, many times the problem is us. Yeah. The, the human yeah. element in that is, causes a lot of problems. And sometimes we cause problems yeah. by trying to correct the problems. Right. You know, many times we, we Boy, try I to... to <laughs> sure, we've all done that, right? I mean, we want to be active. We want to do something. And so we make a problem worse. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, then you can, yeah, you, can, you can beat yourself up about that, too. Yeah. So, I mean, let me just recap a little bit. So, I mean, so what he's saying by no regret is don't, what, don't dwell in, in, in your failure. Like a regret is, oh, I regret I really did that. It's kind of dwelling in the failure as opposed to say, well, okay, I made a mistake, but what did I learn out of it? Is, is that this? Kind of, kind of. It, 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 it's more the, the fear of looking at it that he's talking about. When he's okay. saying no regrets, he says don't be afraid to look at it. Um, 
And yeah, you don't want to dwell in it. Sure, oh, you don't want okay, to live okay, in it. You don't right. want to be caught up with it. I right. mean, but you don't want to forget about it either. You don't want yeah. to say, ah, oh, you know, that's that's too painful. I'm going to ignore it. Oh, I'm going to ignore it. Yeah. Okay. There's so much. There's so much to learn there yeah. when something went wrong. And uh, you know, in relationships, hey, I've I've had a few. You know, I mean, you learn stuff from that. You grow. We've, we've from had that. a few here. <laughs> I know. You know, I mean, the, these things happen, right? I mean, whoops, whoops. <laughs> just like the FDA. But. Um, <laughs> But no, I think that I think it's really important. I think it's important for all of us to keep this really firmly in mind. These two articles really shed a light on 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 how human beings grow and learn and, and where you, where you take that. And the past is really important. Anybody who yeah, you, know, you want to live in the present. Right. You, know, you want to live in the present. Okay, I want to live in the present. We all want to live in the present. But if you don't, if you, as he quotes the famous Santayana quote. You know, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat right. it. Well, if you've made a mistake and you're regretting it and you don't want to look at it because of that, you're never going to get beyond it. Right. So, so look at it, look at it personally, and more importantly for, for this purposes and for the purposes of quality, look at it within your organizations and understand why it happened. You know, do the, do the AAR, not the, the, the MMQ, and figure it out and figure out what you can do with it. I'm going to put you on the spot because I, I don't remember it. I don't know if you do. What was the final line? The, the, the final line in that Roosevelt quote, which is in the story. By yeah, the it's way. in the story. Um, it was. Uh, it was uh, the 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 critic. He closes by talking about the critic and what the critic doesn't get that that the man in the arena does. The yeah. man in the arena gets all the benefit of having gone through it. The, the critic only the benefit of failure. I mean, basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Where where the critic really only gets to sit there and say, ah, eh, nah, 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 nah. I, I tell you, for no other reason, even if you don't read the whole story. Uh, it's a good story, but I mean, click on that link. Uh, uh, there, there, there's a uh, no regret. Yeah. Click on the link below the player. Yeah. Just scan down through the story until you find the Teddy Roosevelt quote. That by itself is just awesome. Well, I, it was the first time I actually had seen it. The the oh, you've never seen that one? I've never it's, seen it. It's, it's like wow. It's a, it's a well known <laughs> yeah. quote. It's a, and, and it was actually when Roosevelt was out of office. It was in 1910. He had been out of office for two years at that point. Yeah. And he was still a young man. He was only 50. Yeah. And he had had a full life. And he had Thank a lot you. of ups and downs. It's <laughs> <laughs> only 50. Cool. Uh, he, had, he had a lot lot of ups and downs. So yeah. he was talking from experience there yeah. uh, at that point. And it's a well known quote. It, it's 35 page speech. So I mean, yeah. yeah you but this can, quote. This quote's about the little quote's about yeah. 100 words, 200 words maybe. Yeah, so so like check that out in the story. Again, that's that's Alan Alan Austin's story. No regrets. Uh, again, right at the bottom of the page, right down there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we're at, uh, basically at the end of our show yeah, here. Yeah, um, yeah. By the way, we had a good uh, we had a good gauging quality. If, you, if you're not familiar, we have a new show that we launched uh, three months ago called mm -hmm. Gauging Quality. It's a once a month show on quality, uh, gauging quality uh, related to you know uh, gauging, calibration, measurement, that sort of thing uh, with myself and Craig Howell who is president of uh, CPM uh, Calibration Labs down in Rancho Cordova, California near Sacramento. Um, third episode yesterday, really good, it was on air gauging. Um, a lot of questions came in, there were quite a few people watching. Uh, we had probably a dozen questions or so mm -hmm. that came in related to well, some of them related to air gauging, some of them were just general gauging questions. So keep your eye open on this show. We're trying to do it once a month. Yep. We've done three so far. Um, so if you're in measurement, you know, metrology, you run a lab, you just want to, or you just want to know, hey, how do they use those micrometers and calipers and stuff, this is the show for you. Yeah, and write us at, at techno-live at qualitydigest.com. If you do have questions that you want us to consider, if you have ideas for a show, we're always up for, for new ideas. And if there's questions that you just have about, hey, how do I do X, Y, Z, whatever it may yeah, be. I won't know. answer it, but I'll forward them on to Craig, on and Craig. we may build a show around it. We may it, build so. a show around so there let us go. know that. And, and yesterday's sponsor of the show was uh, Western Gauge Corporation, Western oh, Gauge right. Corporation, and they're actually sponsoring today's show as well. So thanks to them for uh, sponsoring, again, yesterday's Gauge and Quality, as well as today's episode of QDL. Western Gauge is a leading manufacturer of high-precision dimensional gauging. They have provided air and electronic gauges for unique applications, along with standard air and electronic gauges since 1968. Western Gauge also manufactures their own line of state-of-the-art digital readouts, such as the Micro 2i and the Millicheck for your production gauging needs. For more production gauging solutions, visit online at www.quality, I'm sorry, www.westerngauge.com or click on the banner ad just below there uh, and you can check out Western Gauge there for more we go. information. Okay, well, thank you for uh, joining us yep. once again for a, a, a kind of a packed show. We hope you enjoyed it. Remember, uh, if you have any questions related to this or anything else, send them to us at qdl at qualitydigest.com and uh, we'll try to get your questions on the show. Yes, we will next week. All right, well, we'll see you then. Have a great weekend and we'll see you on Monday. So long. Bye.